Hey now, welcome on out. Happy Sunday, everyone. Uh, I'm excited. Number one, an amazing UFC 258 last night. Uh, we'll be talking about that tonight, and we'll be talking about that with uh, probably I would call an expert in the field, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Scott Cushman, the striking coach over at Rufus Sport. Welcome to the show. Thank you for coming on. Uh, happy Valentine's again yeah. today, everybody. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you for hopping in. Um, we had a last second cancellation. I was going to have a UK comedian. Stephen Hurst come come on and uh, and hang out, but due to the weather and everything that was going on, his shows got canceled this weekend, and I thought it was just perfect timing because number one, I wanted to have you on the show to begin with, and then doing it right after a UFC pay per view, I thought was just absolutely perfect. Um, kicking off, talking about last night, Kamaro Usman, is there an answer to this guy at all? Uh, puts Gilbert Brown, or excuse me, Gilbert Burns down in the third via TKO. Um, puts him down with a uh, southpaw jab. Just puts him down on his ass. Uh, what's your big takeaway from yesterday? Um, I think uh, biggest thing is I actually had Burns to win. I mean, I thought he was really explosive. You know, he showed you know big improvement when he went. You know, ever since he's gone up to one seventy, he's looked phenomenal. Um, but tell what, uh, Usman went and trained with a really good boxing coach, Trevor Whitman, and mad props because, and he cleaned up his game a lot with his hands, and that I th that made the difference. I mean, as everyone saw, his jab was phenomenal. I mean, it hurt him continuously. He rocked him back on his heels, you know. I mean, when he dropped him, uh, Burns was actually in an attempt to throw a kick, so he was on one leg, but he still dropped him with a jab. It was a good sip jab, which I feel is one of the most underused weapons in MMA. Yeah, we were talking about this before the show that that's one of the most underrated or underused things in MMA. But you were talking about doubling, tripling it up, and yeah. and have, having guys in in MMA in general utilizing that better. You want to expand on that a little bit? Well, it's to me is like um, if a jab, you throw a single jab, then you'll see the jab cross. You know, so to me, if that's all you ever do, every time you throw the jab, I'm going to be expecting a cross. So if you you get into the habit of doing the same thing. It's easy to time. So, and by jabbing, uh, double it up, triple it up, even jabbing in different ways, and maybe an up jab, an over jab, a little circle jab. I mean, literally, you can throw your jab six, seven different ways. You know, mm -hmm. it's not, I mean, Pierce, you will, on, you know, it's like, oh, that's not a good clean jab. It doesn't have to be the perfect jab. It has to be a jab that's going to create the opening you want for your next strike. But in Us and but Us uh, Usman didn't do anything spectacular with it. But he he just when he threw it, it was like a piston. He just shot it out. It was uh, what I call a broomstick jab. I mean, you can see when he got hit, you look like someone just boom and hit him back. I mean, snapped his head back. Yeah. And it was a hard jab. You know, I mean, the only other guy that used the jab way back when. Um, I'm going blank here. Uh, Kashuk, I eye check broken uh, against GSP. Uh, GSP, GSP, and he just literally broke, literally broke his face, face yeah. with his jab. So it's a, you know with Farron's gloves, that's the closest thing you can get to a bare knuckle fighting. You know, it's like it's remember the gloves aren't made to protect the person getting hit. Yeah, they're made to protect the hands. You know, so so the jab should get used more because it's going to set up. You just have to learn how to use, get more. Uh, creative with how you use it. Yeah. Um, like I said, we were watching, well, I should say I was watching some of uh, Us Usman's uh, old fights. Uh, I watched the Covington fight. It was one of those I was watching him and I was like, you know what? I was like, I was really curious to see if he was switching stances, going from southpaw to or orthodox, so on and so forth. I think he did that amazingly well uh, on top of the fact that he was just cracking burns with that jab. It felt like it took him a little bit to get warmed up. I, uh, I think Burns came out just hot, pushing the pace right away. But then you kind of saw him fade off a little bit in the second. I couldn't tell if he had burnt himself out or if he had an adrenaline dump. But he wasn't tagging um, Kamaro the way he was in the first round. Was it? Do you think that would have been adrenaline? Do you think that was nerves? What, what do you think that was? I think it was a little bit of uh, he did come out fast. When you do come out, you want to come out hard. And he's, I think he's a more explosive guy, more dynamic of a striker. And, he has, and people think that moving and jumping around is dynamic. But Usman stayed in the pocket, and he, he weathered the storm. He proved he's tough, SOB. Yeah. Man. He, took shot, he took shots that a lot of people would go down from. And it rocked him and all that. But he weathered the storm, and he basically, he, he, in between rounds, they, they 
figured it out. He figured out the range of timing a little bit more. And I'm not saying he wasn't getting hit, but he wasn't getting hit as hard. clean. Yeah. It was clean. You know, you don't have to hit him with the hardest punches. How if you being fine, if you find that chin, you know, the right spot, it doesn't take as much as you think. You don't have to swing for the fences. And I think Usman made it. I mean, you see, Burns had Usman hurt in the first round. Mm-hmm. Usman came back in the second, and he hurt him, and he, he hurt Burns. And then in the third, Usman, I mean, Burns had nothing left. I yeah. mean, it was a matter – it was a little mix of he started a little too fast, uh, maybe a little bit of adrenaline dump, and then the beating he took in the second round too. Getting hit is tiring. <laughs> <laughs> it takes it takes a lot of energy out of you, so it's not that it's not that easy to, one, you, want, you do what you, you – in your mind, you know what you want to do, but your body is like, yeah, no, you just got beat up too much. It ain't going to happen. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it was just an amazing fight through and through. I thought for sure we were in for a, a back and forth fight for five rounds, yeah. uh, the way it was looking, uh, round one, round two. And then round three, you see uh, you see Burns get put down with that southpaw jab. And I was just like, we, we were screaming. We were, we were up on our feet. I couldn't believe it. And then all of a sudden, uh, Herb Dean steps in, calls the fight. Um, an amazing, amazing performance. Let me ask you uh, your personal opinion, though. Uh, I'm looking at the UFC rankings, and I'm looking at who Usman has gone through. So he just finished Burns. Uh, he took Jorge Masvidal uh, on a last-minute fight at UFC 251, beats Kobe Covington, uh, beats Woodley for the title, beats uh, Dos Anjos when he was up at, uh, at 170, takes out Damian Maya. Who's left in the division? Uh, I'm looking at the rankings here. Who's left in the division? Uh, I can't well, Let me see. Did he fight Leon Edwards? I thought he did at one point. Yeah, he fought. Okay, yeah, he fought Leon Edwards back oh. in 2015. Well, that's a long time, time ago. ago. Yeah. Who's evolved there? I mean, Usman's evolved. When he was on the Ultimate Fighter, I wasn't overly impressed with him. But, I mean, again, you stay in the gym and you train, and you get those reps, you're going to evolve as a fighter. You should be. You know, you should. If you're not. It's like you're gonna have a, a, a tough career. Well, you won't be as wrong, around as long mm-hmm. as uh, Usman has, and he's he's showing, you know, I mean, he's showing a lot of heart, and he's showing the fact that he's put in a lot of work and time, and the fact that he left his camp, normal camp, there's normal coaches, that comfort zone, and he went and trained at another gym and everything else, and to put your career, you know, your career basically in the hands of a new coach is, you know, it was, is, it was pretty impressive of him. That was a really interesting, that was a really interesting step that I saw, uh, Henry Hoof take is that he didn't want to corner Burns or, uh, or Usman yeah. that he just kind of went, okay, you guys can do your own thing. Like yeah. I'm not taking anyone's side on this. You know, I get it. Uh, Burns moving up from 155 and then moving up to 170 yeah. and, and becoming the number one contender. Um, that's a hard thing to see. Let me ask you from a coach's perspective. We'll circle back to the the 170 uh, fight in a second. Let me ask you from your own perspective. It, it, have you ever had to deal with that as a coach where you have a fighter who's a number one contender and you ha- or you have someone that's, you know, two guys in the same division that want to fight each other but are on the same team? How do you handle that? Um, I mean, honestly, it's going to be coming up to, uh, you know, the fighters themselves, you mm-hmm. know, because we don't have – that scenario right now. I mean, we had when Anthony was in the UFC, mm-hmm. when Anthony Pettis was there, and guys were coming up. What would happen? There's always scenarios. What would happen? This and that. And so we, Duke and myself, have also talked about it. Um, the only other scenario that we'd have is that right now Sergio Pettis is going to be fighting for the title, and then we have also another stud at 135, Rafi on stocks. Yeah. He's, I mean, he's they've been. I mean, he's he's one or two fights away from there. What do you do? And honestly, it's like we we've all we might just have to like step away and like uh, hey, we love you both, you know. We've been around. I mean, I've trained Sergio since he was 15 years old. I mean, I've been a big part of his training and Rafian from day one. He's come with. He's, you know, Rafian is a fantastic human being. I love the guy. And but it's like I just I don't know who you, who you pick. You yeah. know, it's not. I don't want to be like oh, you picking sides. You're your favorite. Blah blah blah. You know, and it's like you almost have to almost step back. We can suggest things, but be an actual part of it, it would be really tough to do. I think Duke and I have actually talked about it, and I think we'd probably probably do very something very similar. 
Yeah, yeah that's that's, that's gonna be work. rough. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I just I just thought about that off the top of my head. Rafion is undefeated. Moving over, well, he's undefeated. Only, he's got one loss. He does have one loss. One loss. Okay. He got, he got, he went in and he got caught with a spinning back fist uh, in a Dana White uh, in a Dana looking for a fight. Mm-hmm. He just got caught real early, made a very simple mistake, but he got caught. And but he's that's on it. Any other fight, he has barely been touched. Yeah. And you know they are tough fights, but not like nothing big. And he, Bellator, he's undefeated. And he's, you know, he's going to be, a, he might actually be fighting on the same card as Sergio, hopefully, mm-hmm. you know, so we don't know. Yeah. You know? I like, I like Rafian a lot. I do laugh about the fact the first, the first time I met him, we were in a gi jujitsu and I looked at him. I was like, Hey man, he was a purple belt. I think at the time I was like, Hey man, I was like, you're kind of small. I'm like, how much do you weigh? He's like, oh, I'm like 145 right now. I was like, Hey man, I'm like, I'll be nice to you. I won't put all my weight on you. <laughs> <laughs> and it twisted me up like a fucking pretzel. <laughs> Be honest with you, po- pound for pound, Sergio and Rafion are the two strongest guys on the team. Yeah, I mean, you you see them in the gym working out. They're the two two of the strongest guys on the team, and they fight at one thirty five. I know we don't have a lot of big guys, mm-hmm. you know, you know. So, but when you look at then what they put up in mean, strength and conditioning and everything else, it's like it's pretty impressive, you know. And then we, we don't we don't like push like heavyweight with these guys well when they have them the, the coaches the strength and conditioning coaches but they and when they do move weight they're fast they're explosive and i mean they're strong strong guys rafian's rafian Raffi, obviously through wrestling for years you all wrestlers are strong yeah and then you get the crazy strong guys i've seen rafian grapple with uh other national champion uh wrestler and jordan newman who fights at 185 and they they're pretty much even grappling i mean it's really hard for newman to really have to grab him and really try to use all of his strength to even get by him he's yeah yeah, so and same thing with sergio 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 will step on a mat with anybody it doesn't matter what size and what weight and and he doesn't get overpowered it's amazing watching how technical because you know you've been coaching him since he was 15 i've been around since he started and was one of those i'd said something i think to either you or duke um i think you guys were gone for fights this was this was a couple of months ago um i was watching sergio and anthony teach an mma class where they were they were teaching a, uh they were doing fight team and i was watching them go back and forth and explain like certain stuff that they do and I just came off the mats, and I was I was like I was a little tired. I, I was watching him. I was like, it was one of the craziest things in the world to watch Sergio and Anthony work together. But more importantly, like this is someone I've known since I was like since he was 16, 17 years old, and I'm watching him explain to other fighters like how you do how you do certain things. And I was like, this is absolutely amazing. It was a surreal moment to watch him like grow up. And then watch to see where he is now. I'm really excited to see him uh, fight in this Archuleta fight. I think he's going to do real well. I believe that's coming up. Uh, May. May. Yes. Yeah. Uh, big shout to Bellator just signing the deal with Showtime. Uh, being able to. Great for the sport. Yeah. It's amazing for the sport. Uh, CBS, Showtime, uh, Viacom, open promo- or own promotion. Um, and they announced that they were going to do the. Uh, Let's see, April 2nd, Bellator 255, which is headlined by Featherweight title fight. Uh, Fiera, oh, Pitbull, and our, our good our good friend Emmanuel Sanchez. Um, that's part of the tournament, correct? Yes, it's part of the tournament, but it's also for the title. It's a title fight within the tournament. Oh, okay. Yeah, so it's like if he wins the title, um, he'll go into the finals defending the title and for the uh, winning the the tournament man I, I'll yeah. tell you, I can't believe I, you know I'm, I'm happy for him um man he's man he's one of the hardest working people and he's, he's so humble about it he just shows up and he works I mean I remember man he first came up he struggled when he first came to us you know but he picked it up he stayed with it I mean this kid would go work in a factory drive from almost down by Chicago up to the, the gym sleep in his car for a couple hours, come out, go work out, go, you know, instead of like, he'd just sleep in his car so he'd have a little extra sleep and then go right to work. And yeah. he just, he's great. I mean, I never have, you never have to worry about Manny not working hard. Yeah. You have to tell Manny, Manny, it's enough, go home. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> no, all around great guy. Um, If you haven't, if you don't know who Emmanuel Sanchez is, please look him up. He's an amazing fighter. More importantly, 
um, runs the kids jujitsu program over at Rufus Sport. Works amazing with those kids. Yeah. Uh, there's times where I come in at night. He's got those kids. Hard work, dedication, oh, yeah. hard, work, and they're yeah. they're hitting the bag. They're yeah. rolling with each other. Um, that's the type of stuff that I love seeing. And the dude's just constantly positive. Yeah. And and he's you know someone who, I you know I don't fight professionally. I don't do any of that stuff. I don't claim to be anything. But I I like the fact that it's really cool that like I've been around long enough where I can take a look. You know I'll be working on something during sparring. And he'll be like, "Hey Parker, come here. Let me show you how to do that." Where he's like, "I see what you're trying to do. You gotta, you gotta hit that cross harder. You gotta put a little that that cush stink on it." And he goes, and "Then you go to the body." And like, we had this conversation like two weeks ago, and he's just he's so great, and he's easily approachable, and he loves sharing knowledge, and he's one of the greatest guys in the gym. Like I said, I'm really I'm really looking forward to seeing that pit bull fight. Yeah. Uh, and and, I mean, and the first fight, if you haven't seen it, go back and watch the first fight. It was a war. I mean, yeah. it was a great. That was the one in Israel, yeah, right? Yeah, in Israel, yeah. It was a it was a great fight, and it's even on a side note of that. It's like if you watch the interviews they've done, it they're promoting it now. Pitbull is usually a little bit of a you know he's a tough guy. He gets in someone's face. He'll he'll trash talk. Nothing but respect for Manny because he knows he knows. I mean, he Manny won the fight clean, you know, whatever. But it was a, it was a close fight. It would have been there was a couple moments in you know in in the, in the rounds that. If Manny would have done a couple things differently, it could have easily gone the other way. Mm -hmm. Perfect example of Manny's last fight, Daniel Weichel. First fight was a war. I felt Dan M Manny won it. He Weichel got the split decision. Manny came back in this fight, and it shows how much he evolved. And it's only in the last couple of years, and he put on a clinic. He almost finished Weichel. Yeah, that was the yeah. one where he was hitting him with the body. body. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that was that was. Yeah. For for someone who's, how do I put this? I had nothing invested in in Manny's opponent in that one, but it was one of those watch him take those body shots. It was yeah. just oh, yeah, mad, you, you felt those mad props to White Show because tough guy. I yeah, because man, I mean he hurt. I mean it was bad coming back from a body shot. If you've never been hit hard to the body and you got to get up, and that was in the second round, I believe, and he went three more rounds, and Manny was still going to the body hard, and then he started lay kicking, kicking him. him. Yeah, I mean he he probably couldn't breathe and could barely walk after that fight. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, like I said, it was one of those I felt bad, but it also was one of those that he showed amazing toughness that he was able to stick it out to the end of the, yeah. till the end of the fight. But yeah, um, Manny put on a, an absolute clinic body legs and i remember what you know watching that i was like going back into the gym on monday i was like i'm like i want to steal i'm gonna steal that move 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 yeah shout out to manny sanchez i'm stealing some of your moves bro <laughs> um Just don't steal his dance move <laughs> <laughs> let me ask you about this though you know uh continuing on on bellator um, they have the eight man light heavyweight Grand Prix that they're gonna, that they're going to yeah, be doing. One, it'll be fun. One of the first fights yeah. they announced: Rumble versus Romero. What, I'm, no, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, Rumble versus Romero. Uh, uh, Yoel Romero gets cut from the UFC. Uh, Bellator kind of shrugs their shoulder, not sure if they're going to sign him or not. Ends up signing him, putting him in. He moves up from uh, middleweight to light heavyweight. First fight, he's got to fight out the gate. Uh, the 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 soul crusher, uh, Rumble Johnson. You know, I've seen this guy put down guys in the first round. Uh, I'm trying to think. Glover Teixeira uh, he, hits him with one of the meanest uppercuts I've ever seen in my life, and puts what what I thought was one of the toughest guys in the division down cleanly. Uh, what do you expect to see out of this? It's really it depends. I mean, honestly, I I know what Rumble's going to do. He's going to stand there and he's going to be like, he's going to be looking or put his hands on him, and and. Uh, Romero, it's like he'll either look like a complete animal with, with Whitaker. The wars he had with Whit Whitaker were amazing. Mm -hmm. But then when he fought um, Israel, it was a snooze fest. Yeah. And a lot of that is because Romero wouldn't engage. You know, he, And it's like, I don't know if he was hurt. I don't know what, but he wasn't engaging. I mean, if so if, if he engages, I mean, anything can happen. But at the same time, I think Rumble can catch him. Yeah. Which is crazy. When you consider Rumble started at 170, you would think you gotta look at like how did this man ever make 170 pounds? I thought he was doing 155 for a while, no, and then he's so, at 70. He's okay. at 70. He went to 70, 85, 205. I mean, it's like yeah, because he got cut for a little yeah. bit, if I recall. Yeah. Then he ended up coming back yeah. at, as a middleweight, I mean, or no, excuse me, light heavyweight. Yeah. So, I mean, I like. I mean, I'm actually surprised those two got paired up first round. Yeah, same thing here. I mean, they're they're one names alone. I mean, they're. 
Rumble hasn't fought in a while. Yeah. You know, so that could hinder him a little bit. But you don't know how I don't know how much he's been training. You know, I have no idea. Sometimes they just because they're not fighting doesn't mean they're not in the gym. At least you know, a few times a week. You know, three four times a week and get staying in shape and everything. And I mean, because not not fighting for a while. It's not the getting in shape part to me is hard. Is um, timing. Mm-hmm. Like I I have no problem. Like when I'm, I'm an old guy, but I I have no problem if somebody sits back and lets me do th- certain things, I I can handle that no problem. But it's when you know when these young guys that are fast and come at me and I have to defend against that, mm-hmm. that's what gives me problems. You know that timing of everything. Yeah, I have no problem if it was just straight offense, wouldn't phase you one bit. But when you got to mix in that, oh, 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 you know, yeah. the, you know, reacting to what somebody else is going to do, that's probably one of the hardest things for me to learn. Yeah. To figure it, not learn, but figure out. Figure again. out that timing. Yeah, take yeah. that timing. Because right? timing is, to me, is everything. If I can time you, I can own you. Yeah. I'm, you know, for this, for everything that Bellator has going on, I'm really excited to see it. I think they have an amazing product right now, especially with, you know, uh, Sergio fighting for the title against Archuleta. Um, I think this this Rumble, Yoel, Yoel Romero fight is going to kick things off really well and put a, a big spotlight on. I'm also excited to see. Uh, it looks like April 9th they're going to be doing uh, Mashida and Bader as well. Yeah. Um, I'm excited to see how that goes. Two former UFC studs going at it. Yeah. Um, and Corey, Corey Anderson. Anderson. definitely tough. You know, he's he's definitely in the mix. I mean, when Corey's on, Corey can be the beast. You know, yeah. he's he, he's lost. You know, he he's one and one against current UFC champion. Mm-hmm. So. So, I mean, it's I mean, he, he's it's, you know, people all oh, he you know, he's get, he's been caught. But at the same time, I mean, his output is second to none. His, you know, he's a guy at 205. You don't see what he can do very often. The the output that he can do. A bigger guy is obviously if you watch, you know, if you watch fights, the output is always a lot sl- lower. Mm-hmm. But when you can put out the output Corey does, and if you can't handle that, I think he, yeah, I think yeah. he has an amazing gas yeah. tank. Um, and he works hard at it too. Yeah, he's you know everything that he does. Uh, as far as social media goes, he either posts that he's bow, like timing with his bow, or yeah. he's lifting in his garage. You know, during uh, yeah, COVID, during lockdown, yeah, during the COVID yeah, yeah. and stuff like that. Um, you know, that's yeah. all he did. He converted his gym over into a, a weight room, yeah, and, yeah, and he was no. just working out the entire time. Yeah. No, no, he he's has a huge work ethic. I mean, I've he's trained with us for a while, and when he's in town, he visits and everything. Great guy and everything. He, when he went on the show, he just had a huge connection with Frankie Edgar. The show, yeah. Oh, uh, the, uh, ultimate the Ultimate Fighter. Fighter okay. You know? So he had a, you know, with Mark Henry and Frankie Edgar, he had a huge, great connection with them. So that's why he moved out there. It yeah. Wasn't like well, nothing against us. He just connected with them more, and he didn't work with us. Out. He only trained a few times. I mean, a little bit with us for his first couple pro fights, mm-hmm. and that's all. But I mean, great guy and everything, and obviously what they do out there works well for him. Yeah. I, you know, that's that's a guy, you know, no no, no nicer guy in the world, um, married to uh, Jen De Cristo, who who's also from Rufus Sport as well. Um, you know, great couple. You know, Corey's a great guy, so on and so forth. Just want to see nothing but success for him. I am interested to see how this goes for him. I do not know that he, the guy that he's fighting in the first round. I honestly do not know him either. Yeah. Um, so, but I, I, I mean, assuming that he wins, I think a great fight is either him fighting Bader or Mashida. Um, as well, yeah. Uh, in the semifinals, I think that's e- Mish- either one. Either one of those is that's Mish- that's a yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, Mashida's a puzzle. Mashida's like uh, how I mean, back when Mashida, you know, was real up and coming, and he stepped on the scene, and it was like nobody saw his style of fighting. Yeah, it's kind of like how Wonder Boy is right now with his karate and all that. That style, the average person doesn't see. And it's like not classic box. Oh, they would do this, would do that, but they're that that's that that style of fighting they're so good at managing the space and distance that people can't figure it out you know mm-hmm. they want to be like, oh we got to step to you. be like no you know you i'm not gonna step to you you come to me and they're very selective of when they attack mm-hmm. so it's like when they hit and they're also they're gone yeah. so i mean machita's timing and that managing that space and distance which is so important it's hard to figure out for a lot of people and it's not even it's not even um, the fighters, the coaches. If the coaches haven't been around it, it's like, oh, you know, if you've only been one sport, you know, in one style of fighting, 
it, if you see something new, it's hard to figure it out. And that's why if it, one of the things we are blessed with is Duke. Duke, his style of fighting, he grew up doing the long pants, so what, what uh, Wonder Boy does. He, you know, he's done the Muay Thai. He's done so many different, as, you know, he's grew up, literally, he grew up fighting. Mm-hmm. You know, he grew up, that, and he's never had a regular job. He's, all he's done is everything's been involved with fighting. He's either teaching it, tr- doing it, coaching it. So he, that's why, I mean, we're Duke, well, not myself, because it's all Duke, but uh, against Wonder Boy, he's 3-0. and all. Well, he's, he's 2 0 oh, and one yeah, because it was a split decision with yeah. Woodley. Well, no, it was a, one was a draw. Oh yeah, the one draw, was a split yeah. Decision, and then Anthony knocked him out. Yeah, yeah. and uh, yeah, I was going to bring that up to your point was you know what that is just an amazing tool to have, like someone who's used to fighting that style. The knowledge of, of what you do and why you do it, you know, it's like traditional boxing. Boxing is good, but not everything in boxing works in MMA because mm-hmm. it's you know not everything in other thing. It not not everything relates to the sport. MMA is is unique in in fighting. Yeah. Um I was going to circle back to Corey. Corey got started um in Rufus Sport through Ben Askren, Correct. correct? Yes. Um do you mind me bringing up Ben Askren right now? You're no, you're currently all. coaching him for the is I, it Jake I'm, Paul or Jake Paul, yeah. Jake Paul. Yeah, boxing match. Okay. I mean, it's technically uh you know, an exhibition, but obviously it's like Jake Paul's you know, he's making his name for it. He's a YouTuber, you know. I didn't even realize, I mean, it's crazy to think how much money this kid makes yeah. doing that stuff. It's insane. And it's like, hey, props to him. Go make your money, man. Yeah. But at the same time, Ben's offensive output in boxing is has never been that big. No, I mean, the most he's probably ever boxed in a fight is against uh, Damian Maia. That's what I was going to say. Was he Maia. Was, yeah, he, he was, looked good. Yeah, he's good. But at the same time, he never trained for that much, that, that often. So he had tired him out in a different way. Mm-hmm. So when he did hit the ground, he was a little more fatigued than he might normally be. And then also, if you look at Ben early fight before he came to us, I mean, even though he was winning fights, he'd, he's getting beat up. Mm-hmm. You know, and he'd just, he's so, he is so tough that he would just get to where he wanted to be. He, he wanted to prove that his wrestling was good enough to beat everybody, that positioning. Um, but once he got with us, his understanding of striking, he didn't use it as an offensive measure. measure. He used it defensively. Yeah, I was going to say he watch, never got he hit. He doesn't get hit. Yeah. I mean, the most he's probably Jay Her- Heron is probably the most he's been hit. I mean, I think in 2017, he fought like four times. I think he, literally, if you can, it, it, literally on the punch stats, he got hit, hit 10 times in one year in four fights. In four fights? Yeah. yeah. I mean, he uh, in uh, Bellator, he, he uh, fought the Russian. I I, yeah, I know who you're talking well, about. He did the, uh, yeah, the cowboy oh, thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, literally, ben, ben, took him, ben took him down. I mean, I think he got hit twice in that fight. It was yeah. a five-round fight, but, I mean, it was literally it was like one of the most lopsided striking things you'll ever see in your Yeah, fight. Ben hit him like 300, yeah, 300 times the four. I hit him like the four. It's like, yeah, it's unheard of. Yeah. So people are going to sleep on that. You know, Jake Paul is... He's got a killer right hand, mm-hmm. you know, but he's never had to go push beyond. Ben knows how to weather storms and go, you know, a little deeper. He's fought. He's got in one fight. He's had more rounds than Jake Paul has, mm-hmm. you know. You know, it's like Jake Paul has had uh, videos where he's knocking people out, but that looked like bum fights. It looked like he brought in some of his posse that he that he that hangs around with him, and they're like, "All right, you you've been, you know, on my." I'm on nutsack for a while, so I'm gonna let you, I'm gonna knock you out a little bit for the front, <laughs> for the camera. Yeah. <laughs> let me ask you this: um, as far as as far as this kind of celebrity boxing thing that's going on, there's uh, rumors now. Well, let me circle. Let me get to that in a second. I, sh- I guess I should say, what are your feelings as as kind of someone who who coaches striking, seeing someone like a YouTuber? Uh, celebrities coming in like Jose Canseco fought last week against I think an intern from Barstool Sports um, what's your outlook on how this goes are you just like hey get your money or is it kind of one of those things that's just kind of a circus now um, you know what I'm not going to hate on anyone they go get paid if you if you come and pay out for me at like three four million dollars to fight someone my age you know yeah. I go do it 
I'd be crazy not to. <laughs> You're crazy not to. But, yeah. but nobody knows me. Everyone goes, well, are you, I'll fight the guy. Well, nobody knows you. They don't care. Yeah. You know, they, these guys are known throughout, you know, whatever, their sport or, you know, Jake Paul at the YouTube and all that. I looked it up and I'm like, this kid's got like 20 million followers. It's insane. Yeah. So there's 20 million people that potentially are going to pay to watch him fight. Do you got 20 million people? Yeah. If you don't, <laughs> why would they pay you $4 million to fight? Me? I'm like, no, they're yeah. going to pay me. They don't know who I am. They don't care. Nobody cares. Anybody in the same thing. Anybody else. The average guy, you know, fighters want to be like, oh, I'm better than them. Maybe you are. But guess what? Nobody knows you. They don't want to pay to see the average person fight. They yeah. want to pay. They want to see a name. Like in fighting to me is like, it's not the hardcore fans that you got to worry about. You want the casual fans. Hardcore fans are always going to do a pay-per-view. They might bitch about it, price going up and all mm -hmm. that, but they're still going to get it. They're going to, people, are gonna, they want to see it. They're the hardcore fans. It's the casual fans. When someone's mom knows who you are, case in point, I had somebody go, says a friend of my girlfriend said, oh, I, I don't watch MMA, but I've heard of that Conor McGregor guy. <laughs> and in fact, you know, you've never watched MMA, but you know, know who the he name. is. Yeah, you make you know. You know so I say, that's Anthony Pettis. Same thing. Going back, and people don't know watch MMA. They've heard that name, Anthony Pettis, mm -hmm. and that's why they have that star power. You know, and that's why you get paid to fight, yeah. win or lose. But, you know, Conor McGregor's at the point where it's like he's getting paid. half the people pay to watch him win. The other half pay to watch him get his butt whooped. Yeah, you know, it's like, you know, that's why you got that love hate relationship. So I have no problem with these YouTubers and all that fighting. Mm -hmm. You know, as long you know, it's like now it's like if but to claim you're a true fighter, yeah, you know, go against you know the the top guys. Yeah, like you know, I mean, you're you're very unrealistic to think that like put it, go in, go in, get even a sparring session. Canelo actually goes to Jake Paul and his brother. Uh, What's his brother's name? Logan. Uh, Logan, Logan Paul, Paul, yeah. And he goes, come on and I'll show you a real sparring session. You know, and it would be like, Canal would piece them oh, up. Yeah. Back. yeah, yeah. And it's like, and you know, nobody should allow that to happen because it's like, it's, there's levels to this. Yeah. And so what he's doing against other people, I have no problem with that whatsoever. Go get paid, make your money. Let me ask you this going even a, a step further. Do you have any – there's a rumor now that uh, Tyson Holyfield 3 might be putting be, getting put together. Uh, Tyson potentially getting 20 to $30 million to sign for this fight. Uh, a possible $100 million uh, fee to go do this over in Abu Dhabi. Um, what's your opinion on two mid-50-year-olds fighting uh, again? You give me twenty, thirty million, I'll step in there. I might get my ass, but I'll step there. You give me twenty, thirty million, I'll, hey, let's go. But at same, again, I have no problem with it. You know what I mean? Because you go look at what Mike Tyson and Roy Jones did. That was, I mean, Tyson. People was, oh, Roy Jones should have done this. I don't think people realize that how bad Tyson was hurting him to the body. Mm -hmm. He was ripping up. Yeah, you know, he was ripping the body. I mean, in his fifties, doing that stuff, it's scary. Yeah. He looked crispy too, yeah. and he was training with uh, Kings MMA uh, coach um, Rafael Cordero. Cordero. Oh yeah. yeah, and Cordero said he had to get soul shoulder surgery after for holding pads for Tyson because he was he was still cracking. Yeah, you know, early fifties, yeah. mid fifties, still cracking yeah. the pads that fucking hard. Yeah, well, uh, I like to think you know I'm I'm in I'm my late fifties, but I'm like most of my young guys are like going. All right, you're fast. You can hit pretty hard. I can't move, but you step in front of me, I'm going to let one loose. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but at the same time, it's, you know, I have no, again, do you fight somebody your same age level and everything else? I mean, would he do the same thing against a younger guy? The lower level guys, yeah. maybe. The higher level guys, it'd be hard pressed to do yeah. it. Just, I mean, but he looked phenomenal physically. He grew mad props. He, I mean, he obviously, Mike, when he got. You know, going through his issues, whatever, he gained a lot of weight. But you look at him, he put the side-by-side -side when he was in his, a champion to now. It's like, yeah, he was thicker and all that, but he still looked phenomenal. Yeah, he looks like you an know? amazing, yeah. amazing shape. Yeah. Whatever. The fact that he and did what he did, mad props. Yeah, he put, it, he put it on Roy yeah. Jones for sure. Yeah. Um, where else was I going to go? Uh, Bellator light heavyweight. Oh, I remember what I was circling back to. We got off topic. Um, I was talking about uh, Kamaru Usman. Um, where do you where do you go now with Kamaru? You have this product who who looked very boring against a Jorge Masvidal. 
but looked explosive against Burns. Um, there are two guys that he hasn't fought recently. Uh, Leon Edwards, he fought back in 2015. Leon Edwards can't get a fight to save his life right yeah. now. His fight right before quarantine with Tyron Woodley gets canceled. That was going to be at the O2 Arena in London. Uh, his fight with the up-and-comer, um, I forgot what his name is. Um, I think uh, Gerald fought him. Yeah, yeah, Gerald got caught by him yeah. early. Yeah, I, I know, yeah, that fight. But, again, you know what? The UFC, they're matchmakers. What they understand, their job is not to make champions. Their job is to make contenders. Because mm -hmm. if it's not, to me, it's not good. It's fine as one, if the hit for the champion to have an easy fight all the time. You know, like, oh, I'm going to get to cherry pick, uh, you know, who I get to fight and all that. You know, you fight, if you're the champion, you know, I mean, you should, you might have a little bit of leeway, but maybe two or three, uh, if they get put a list of like three people, but you have it might have a good choice to pick out of that but you don't you shouldn't have just like cakewalk all the time you're the champion defend the belt i and don't think any of those are, are cakewalks at all gilbert no. burns is no. a killer yeah uh, well, i'm just saying it's like you know it's like people talk about all oh, the top 15 but again these guys it's up there it's up to the fighters and their camps to make, get these fighters evolved ready to do like um, ready to fight, you know, and, and you know, beat these guys. So this, he, he looks good, and I mean, I'd have to. I'm, I'm gonna be honest. I don't know that many guys at the 170, and it'd be, I'd have to look beyond the top five. But at the same time, it's like you have to. You get them. And these guys, styles make they always, that old adage, and I mean, styles make fights. You know, yeah. this guy's good at this. Gets this guy's good at that. It doesn't matter. But then it's a puzzle. You figure it out. Like as a coach. You and Duke and I look at film. We don't just look at their offense. We look at how they respond defensively. Because I, all right, easy. It's like okay, he's got a habit of doing this offensively. Okay, you can you can defend that. But when I, I'm looking at what does he do when he gets does certain strikes, you know, when he's thrown at him, does how does he defend? How does he react? Mm -hmm. And that's where you you try to capitalize on those things. Okay. Yeah. Um. So I mean, going back to your question. I don't know who they're going to put with them, but it's like these guys, It's again, it's not up to the matchmaker to say, hey, you're next in line. Let's go. Let's see what you got. Yeah. You know, there's always somebody. There's always going to be somebody up and coming, the new guy, the sport. I mean, the sport is only 25 years old. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's it's new. And, it's, it's, and you know, the UFC is only 25. The sport might be a little older than, you know, the, you know the hardcore stuff, but – the UFC that that the higher levels is only twenty five years old. I mean, you go back watch early. I remember watching early UFC, and you're like, oh wow. And it's like these guys wouldn't even make it. They wouldn't even be there right now. Yeah. You know, early UFC was like freak show type stuff. Oh, I remember watching UFC one, and in the first fight out the gate, I think was a sumo wrestler versus a kickboxer. Yeah, well, I, I remember that fight. That guy uh, Hackman. He's. I think he lives down in Illinois. He hit him with the overhand, the axe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he just. Yeah, I hit him with that punch. It's like, how do you fight a guy that big? Well, you, one, you don't want to be – don't get underneath him. Yeah. And don't be dead in front and standing in front of him. <laughs> yeah. But I think he knocked his tooth out in that fight, too, if I recall yeah, correctly. Yeah, I that think was – he broke his hand on his head, too. Yeah. yeah. That, that, those were wild times back yeah. then. There was a – they had a boxer who – I think With he one, wore one glove. One, wore yeah, one glove. Yeah. And if I re, if I recall the story was correct, that he needed to have one hand free, so just in case he got he got they caught, take, yeah, he, they, so he yeah. could tap out. Yeah. Well, it's I mean that just shows Gracie Jiu Jitsu blew up with you know with Hoist, and it was like they wanted to show the smaller guy. Hoist wasn't you know probably the first guy they wanted. They probably wanted Rick Hicks and Gracie mm -hmm. Hicks. But if you look at Hicks and Gracie when he was young, he was pretty jacked you know and everything he looked like a fighter you know hoist was like oh you look like a nice guy and but no one would be going oh i don't want to fight this dude he looks like a beast you know yeah you know but um it, it everyone evolved you learned you know that oh i need to learn that if you get beat by it you get good at it you should be getting good at it yeah you know if you even if you're not the thing is to me is even if i don't use it to win a fight i don't lose to a fight because of that does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So it's like so the everything's evolved so much now. I mean, we look at back when Hoist fought um, the old uh, uh, 170 pound champion out of uh, Iowa. Uh, he got in a train wreck. Oh, um, 
I know exactly. Not Forrest, Forrest Griffin. Uh, no. Matt Hughes. Matt Hughes. I mean, Matt Hughes destroyed him. You know, and on the ground, he took him down. You know, yeah. but you know, usually the wrestler be like, "Oh, I'm just going to wrestle on top," but they don't understand jujitsu, and they get submitted. Well, he didn't use jujitsu to win; he just used it to not lose. Yeah, he got on top. And he you know beat him. You know, Hoist has never evolved. You know, which is but still he. But even now to this day, Hoist still gets paid to go fight once in a while. Yeah, uh, you know? it's like he fought Ken Shamrock. Yeah. Uh, that was the third or fourth time that they met. I want to say a couple of years ago in Bellator. I remember oh, yeah, that was the. Uh, yeah, Manny was on that yeah. card. Yeah, I t- I totally remember that now. Yeah. I was watching that fight over at a, Trinity. It was an injury. I think uh, Shamrock got hurt or something happened to him. Yeah, yeah. he went down pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, what else was there? Was a. Uh, Dada five thousand and uh, the Miami Street Fighter, um, oh, yeah. Kimbo Slice. Kimbo Slice. Those guys both fought on that yeah. one. Yeah, that was an amazing card. Well, I shouldn't say amazing, but it was, it was fun. It was a fun, it was fun. card. It was, it was fun. fun. Yeah. It was funny because Manny fought on that card. It's funny. Manny fought on that card, and it was everyone was so impressed. The, like, Hoist Gracie came up to Manny after his fight, and he, was, and he, goes, and he was shaking his hand about uh-huh. how good he was. I mean, other fighters love Manny. Yeah. Yeah. They. I mean— you know, they they hate to fight him, and he's that guy. I'm a, I mean, I mean, there's not knocking Manny. I love him, you know. But it's like you look at him. He's not. He's evolved physically. You know, he used to be look like a little pudgy. You know, even then when he was cut weight, he was like not not a lot of muscle on him. Everything now with his his girlfriend's got him. He's eating his diet on point. Mm-hmm. You know, he looks way better when he cuts the weight. But everyone goes, oh, he's not that fast. He's not. You know, he's not this. He's not that. But what they can't, what nobody can understand is. The pressure, yeah. The man, Manny has no quit. Manny will push the pace, and I, I, I was, every time. I mean, it was a three round fight. I said, Manny, you know, you own this round. I mean, nobody. I've never seen Manny lose a the the, the third round of a fight. I mean, a three round fight. Well, you know, because nobody was like first pressure. Okay, Manny goes in. He used to take a lot of damage. He's another one. He used to take a lot of damage. You know, weather the storm. So he's tough as hell, and get to second, then he gets third. But he, I mean, he's the pressure that he can put in his motor is a weapon. Having that kind of endurance is a weapon. Set a pace. He's figured it out now. His last few fights, he sets a pace early. Now he used to be like a little slow starter. Now he gets out the gate a little faster because now it's like, oh, I set the pace fast. I can keep it going. These guys start fading, mm-hmm. and it's a, it's a weapon. Being in shape is a huge weapon. Yeah, he he just has that real deep gas tank. Um, Going back to what you're saying, yeah, he's he's put it all together. I was talking to him uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I was like, oh, he was like, hey, Parker, you know, you look like you're losing your, your quarantine weight. I was like, oh, thanks. Uh, thanks for noticing, man. I, I appreciate it. <laughs> girly figure back. <laughs> yeah, but it was one of those. I was, I was having a conversation with him, and I was like, hey, man, I'm like, what do you get down to anyway, like body fat percentage? What do you get down to for uh, for your fights? And he was like, like 3%, and I was like, Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and Manny doesn't carry, like, a huge amount of weight on him, you know, no. like, in between the muscle-wise and that. But So it's just good weight. He just walks around at a good, healthy weight. Mm-hmm. And then when he cuts, it's just lean. But then the whole idea is to, re, you know, hydrate back up. I mean, these guys, literally, when you say, oh, at 145, they're at that weight for the, the amount of time it takes to step on the scale. And then they're just putting it right back on. Yeah. I mean, you don't want to put an excess amount on, but there's guys that will put on, I mean, it's easy 15 pounds. So if you think there's, you know, 15 pounds for the smaller guys, you know, so if you guys, they fight at 45, man, he's, you know, close to 160 when he fights. When he steps in the cage. Yeah. 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 So it's, it's different. The bigger guys, you know, I know dudes that they don't, they just fight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, but, you know, but smaller guys, definitely. Well, they had that one guy, he fought at 85, uh, Vienna. He was on, I think his name is Vienna. He was, uh, 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 the, uh. BJJ champion, eight-time, you know, champion. He was a huge. He was, he was undefeated. Uh, he was on the main card, I believe, and he ended up getting. He's huge. I mean, he's a freaky. I mean, he's a scary-looking guy, muscular as hell, and he got the guy down early, but he couldn't get it. Squeeze his arms out. Second round, he was dead, and his kid actually came back, and was dinging him bad, hurt him bad, and he ended up getting a submission against one of the best pure grapplers in the world 
You're talking about Vieira and Hernandez from yesterday? Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. Vieira was like a little eight-time champion at the best. Uh, I'm not follow grappling that much, but it's uh, – is an eight-time champion at one of the highest level tournaments in the world. Yeah, and and it's like he's pure grappler, just a beast. He gets in there against this kid, couldn't gra- couldn't finish him in the first round. By the time he got done, he was so tired, he couldn't get and he couldn't defend a punch to save his life. And he ended up getting submitted, which is, you know, it's huge. Yeah, um, you were saying Vienna. Uh, I was watching her yesterday. I was texting uh, a second friend of mine about her about how slick her jujitsu was. Yeah. But then I go and look her up. Um, she's, she's the, right there, the strawweight. Right yeah. Beat up the guy in Brazil. Yeah, yeah. She she beat up the mugger, so yeah. on and so forth. Um, and then I look into her. She's a in in Brazil. They have jujitsu state champions, and right. she's a twenty three time yeah. state champion. And I was like, but her jujitsu was slick on the ground. She she went for a triangle, and then she was going for the triangle arm bar. And then she was hitting, she was trying to hit a Americana from triangle, and then she transitioned to the arm bar, and then transitioned back to the triangle, yeah. and then transitioned back to the arm yeah. bar. That was just amazing jujitsu. Um, that is a great. That that's going to be a competitor definitely for the strawweight division. That girl's jujitsu is scary. If she, keeps, if she keeps evolving with her, I mean. And she's only twenty two. Yeah, if she if her striking is is good but not great, and the thing is what she has to work on, it's like if she's that good on the ground, it, if she gets striking down, she's gonna be truly scary. Yeah, because all fights start on your feet. You gotta have, if you can't strike good, you have good wrestling to get to the ground. To the ground. But if you only strike and jits, that in between is tough. You know, because how do you transition your striking to get to your you're grappling. Mm-hmm. You know, you have to have a little bit of mix, mix of everything in there. That's why MMA is so hard. But if she evolves the way she should, and hopefully, I mean, she does, because it's great for the women's sport. And women's MMA is growing bigger and bigger. And I mean, it's easier for women to get in because it's newer, and they need they will need bodies and everything in there. But at the same time, some of these girls are phenomenal. I mean, some guys don't like it. Some guys just watch it for oh it's two chicks fighting you know yeah. <laughs> but it's i mean the skill level to yeah it's great i mean i was on the show with some of these girls and they're, they're tough as nails they work their asses off and i mean they deserve i mean a lot of credit yeah i mean they, oh it's easy for them to get in maybe it is but it's not like they're just handing it to them you know they're still got to work hard and they still got to win yeah you know um, also, while we're on the topic of the the undercard from last night, big shout out to Bilal Muhammad, yeah, Bilal. Uh, putting it on, getting the decision last night uh, against uh, Diego Lima, Douglas Lima's uh, younger brother. Uh, looked crispy last night, um, and couldn't happen to a better guy as far as fighting yeah. goes. Um, he's hilarious. He he's putting it all together. High pressured up against the cage. Yeah. Um, I think he hit one takedown last night. But he got he was, one in the third round. Yeah. I think. Yeah. And then, uh, but yeah, he but was he's putting it on last night. Up, yeah, yeah, his number, yeah. High, again, he's a guy, high, very high volume. He's a guy, the guy that he won't, he would, his, his motor is phenomenal. I mean, he, he does, he does, takes fights during the, uh, I, pardon me, I don't know the, the name of the, 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 um, the Muslim, uh, oh, the, uh, the Ramadan. I was going to say, Ramadan. like, I think it's yeah. Ramadan. Yeah, Ramadan. He's fasting where he doesn't eat from sunrise to sun, sunset, but he's in the gym training and he trains hard. Yeah, he's done that yeah, twice. Yeah, now. he's yeah, and he he'll take fights. You know, he I mean, so he not only physically but mentally strong guy. You know, and he's yeah, he all the credit to the world. I mean, he's not training with us anymore, but you know, still you know, I text you know brought him you know and and fired if I if I like you guy. I mean. If you're not training with us, I don't care. We, we, it wasn't a bad therm lift. It was just part of the thing with COVID. And him, it was just ended up being easier for him to stay down there in Chicago. Yeah. But, yeah, he, I mean, he's got a huge upside. He's at 13, so winning this fight and as dominant as he was, he'll probably – he might get a top 10 guy next time. I'm hoping so. Yeah. Um, that's, you know, well, again, deser- well deserved. Yeah. Another guy that I'm just, you know, I constantly root for. Yeah. Um, did we bring up Macy Barber? No. We no. Okay. No. I know we were talking about her off air. Um, does she always fight at flyweight? I feel like for some reason she was no, fighting at strawweight. She before. was strawweight. Macy's uh, Macy's martial arts, and she's you know, she's getting older. You know everything. It's she's not by any means big, but she's you know 
but for she's she's very she's a very muscular girl for that size with that weight class yeah she's you built know? yeah and um it just seemed to me in her fight she had a trouble managing that space she was like on the outside too much and waiting she was throwing a lot of punches and faint and fakes were at a distance that didn't matter it's like Alexa Grasso just stood there like, okay, what are you doing? You want to come on in, come on in. And then when she did came in in the first couple rounds, she got cracked pretty good a couple times. Yeah. You know, and she did a couple good things, but it wasn't enough to win their first two rounds. And then she knew she was behind. And she went out, she went out, she won the round, she did it all out. And everyone goes, well, why didn't you go do that earlier? Well, because earlier... You got a fresher Alexa Grasso coming and cracking, you know. Yeah. It's like it's like, hey, go in there, yeah. You go in there. It's like it's not. It, I know it's not easy, but at the same time, it's she just. It was just something that she couldn't didn't figure out right away. Yeah, and it, she just got she it was, it was to me is that is like a puzzle. You have to figure that puzzle out. You can figure out in a minute. You might might take you a while. It took her a little longer. And then at the same time, Alexa Grasso might have got a little more tired, or she thought, "Oh, I got two rounds in the bag. I'm just gonna, you know, I'm just, I'll, you know, won't go as hard. I'll almost like play a prevent type of game or fight in the third round." Yeah. Um. To to your point, I was trying to figure that out in the first two rounds because she was throwing jabs at distance where it was like three to four feet away from her. I couldn't figure if she was still trying to get in. But you know what? Here's the thing, man. She's a young kid. I think she'll be back, hopefully. She has a huge upside. Yeah. I mean, Macy, Macy's got a great, you know, good work ethic. She just has to, I mean, a lot, and a lot of this game is mental. You know, it's like, you know, she, what, she's, this is only a 10th fight, and she's 22 years old now. I mean, she has a huge upside. So, I mean, she just, all she has to do is literally just keep training, get better. I mean, you, you, there's no substitute for getting reps, getting better scenarios. We, you know, we don't do crazy hard sparring, but we do a lot of drilling. And you still got to spar hard, mm-hmm. but people um, mistake sparring hard as getting hit harder. No, if you, you can spar hard, if you have good defense, you know, like Max Holloway recently said, oh, he, he didn't spar that much. He, you know, it's causing him problems. That's what Max did now. What did he do earlier? A lot of fighters don't take that much abuse in fights. They probably take more abuse in the gym and war, gym wars. Mm-hmm. You know, boxing back in the day used to be known for that. But it's like just get better at defense throughout their whole thing. Defense should never go out of style. And I think a lot of times people fall in love. Oh, I got headgear on. I got big gloves on. You know, I can take these shots. And if you take them, if you get in the habit of just taking a shot, you know, it's going to be there later on. You can tough. But that doesn't mean it's you're not gonna have damage. Yeah, sixteen yeah. ounce versus yeah, four ounce. Four ounce, ounce. Yeah, I mean Duke Duke's he's used the, the analogy of paying bills. You got, you have pay bills to pay. You have a checking account and a savings account. You pay your bills with your checking account, and then your savings account is your emergency fund and you know your savings. Skill, defense is your checking account. Your toughness and being able to like weather that storm is your savings account. I'm not gonna pull. I'm gonna pull out my checkbook more than I pull out my you know my my my, <laughs> my savings account. I'm not gonna open up my savings account until I my checkbook runs out of money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's when I'm gonna bust into my savings account. And I and you gotta look at it that way when it comes to fighting too. It's like it's like oh yeah, I can take a punch. There's a lot of tough dudes. I can take a punch too, but I mean I'm gonna want to. Yeah. You know. <laughs> well, the idea the 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 idea that I feel that you and Duke really teaches don't get hit you know yeah. uh be you know be defensive what what i really i was talking about this last night with uh with a couple of guys i was watching uh the fights with um skylar burns uh sadiq uh ruben from the gym uh big shout out to them and uh brothers for hosting the fights last night um we were talking about this last night where i was like you know what my comfort zone is kind of that tie style where it's not really like i don't really want to crack people hard from from my personal perspective I'm 200, somewhere between 200 and 220 pounds at any given time. Everyone in the gym is smaller than me. I don't want to hit them. I don't want to have to put power on them. What I like doing is kind of playing that tag. Like I tag you, got you, got you, got you, got you there, got you there. And being able to put that combination together where I'm not trying to put it on someone, but I am trying to get them to ball up and see if I can do, kind of get you to back up, throw that head kick and just be like, or can I get you to ball up, get up on one leg? hit you with that body shot, but not 
crank them on it. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I mean, I, I, we, we teach guys to fight in third gear, even in a, in, in fighting third gear. So that means you got third gear. If you're, if you're hurting people in third gear, you still got fourth and fifth gear, you know? <laughs> so that's what we try to teach. And it's like, that's why most of our guys, people come and visit and they're like, Oh, you guys spar hard. You know, we just defend well, mm -hmm. you know? It's like, if you're getting hit a lot, first and second gear is going to seem hard. You know, so defend better and everything. And I agree with what you're saying as far as like, oh, I'm going to touch. But I mean, like, you know, like if somebody's got a headgear on, I don't aim for the face. I aim for the logo on their forehead, the pet, the knob. Because I like if I and I practice my accuracy that way. I will if I hit that logo. Let's say you got an Everlast headgear and you got an Everlast right now. I'm going to go. Poof, I'm going to go for that Everlast every single time. Why? Because I'm not trying to bust you up in your face. Yeah. But I'll still ding you on the forehead. You got all that padding there. But what I we tell people, you you, you got to practice hitting hard once in a while, with because you got is controlled hard. So that's when you can go to the body a little harder. Body shots gonna hurt, but at the same time they're not gonna cause that lasting damage. Mm -hmm. So it's like we tell people, if you got shin guards on, you got big gloves on, dig that body hard, and leg kicks. You know, kick the body hard, leg kicks, pull your head kicks. Don't blast to the head with punches, and that's a lot of people don't get. They mm -hmm. get they think it's just about punching hard to the head you know and it's like another thing is underused in you know all striking sports body shots with your hands you know if you hurt somebody with a body kick we tell people all the time go back to the body with your hands your hands are easier to land hurt with the body than the kick mm -hmm. but once you get the kick go back to it with your hands yeah you know so people just have to understand learn how to train better smarter not necessarily not train harder just train smarter Mm -hmm. not take that damage so on and so forth yeah you know, like, and you, like i said you have to be able to have that practice going at somebody so we we stress body shots we, we i mean it's in a sick perverted way we, it's like you get a body shot and you almost laugh and you're like oh i got him got him got him. <laughs> you know but at the same time you're not being malicious about it but it's because you're not doing the permanent damage it's just knocking the wind out or you just freeze them for that second the hard the hard punch knockout we don't do like i mean we just had a guy i just had a kid uh sparring saturday and he threw a head kick and he pulled it and he literally just laid it on the guy and the guy tried to grab his leg and take him down and i stopped it right away and i'm like you have to understand he pulled the kick if you want to pull the kick you would be on the ground you have to understand instead of like trying to run him over and potentially tearing his hamstring or something you have to like stop and be like Whew. Thank you for not knocking me off. Yeah, <laughs> you know, you know, I know you don't understand. It's a, almost like an etiquette thing. Punch, you know, pull your punches to the head, pull your kicks to the head, go for that body, look for your leg kicks. Like wrestling, people have no problem taking you up and slamming you on the mat, but you have an issue with me punching you to the body hard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to me, it's like I'm gonna get hurt more from a slam from wrestling than you hit me to me hitting you to the body hard. Yeah. You know, so people just, I mean, it's a learning, it's a learning curve. Everyone's learning. Coaches need to learn. Fighters need to learn, you know, and it's like how to train hard and still be safe at the same time. It's not easy, but it's something you always have to be aware of. Let me ask you a question, like, cause I've always just been curious about this with, with coaching in general. Do you read any other like coaches books? Like I know, uh, coach Kavanaugh did a book, um, like uh, off the top of my head, Sir Alex Ferguson from Manchester United. Shout out to Manchester United. Um, <laughs> but do you do you read up on what other coaches do psychologically or or coaching wise to, to improve yourself at all, or is it just? Uh, no, I mean to me, I don't. Not that I do watch. We do watch film on fighters. We'll use um, Duke is obviously a huge. Not his his pool of knowledge is immense, and we he uses that. He'll send. We watch certain style of fighters. We're like, everyone wants to, uh, oh, Roy, uh, not sorry, Roy James, uh, um, Mayweather, the Mayweather, the shoulder roll. That that works great in boxing, but in, in kickboxing, in straight kickboxing alone, it wasn't going to work. You're going to get kicked hard here to, with your lead leg. You're going to get low kicked. MMA, you got to take your shoulder roll, you're, you're going to get the takedown. So all you got to do is recognize, I'm, if I have, see the habit of you rolling the shoulder, I'll throw the cross to make you roll your shoulder, and I tell the guy right away, going right behind it for the takedown because his shoulder's rolled. Mm -hmm. Don't let him get the shoulder back. You know, So it's like not everything's going to work there. So to me, striking is a philosophy. 
there's a lot of different philosophies out there. You to make a philosophy work, you pretty much have to stick to that philosophy. Okay. You know, and it's like, and then, but once you do, you once you master it, then you start cherry picking things and what's going to work. You know, it's because not like cause not everything's going to gel. This works with what I'm doing and what I'm trying to do. Does that make sense? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, I see that. Um, yeah, that's that's an amazing perspective. I dig that. I dig that a lot, man. Um, do you adjust that when you cherry pick then to the individual then that you're working with, or is it just kind of a, a general philosophy for for all of them? Uh, well, if there's certain things, I, I I do a lot of things personally. I mean, I'm I when I started training, I at the gym, I didn't train with Duke that much. Mm-hmm. You know, Duke was still fighting. Um, so I worked with Jason Strout, our old, old striking coach. And then when he Duke did come back, I was laid off at the time from my job. And I was just a student. And I'd be in the gym. It was open gym. I'd go in there, hit the bag. And Duke's teaching a private lesson. And I just watch his feet. And I watch what he did. And I mean, I'm, I mean if, I, if you watch your feet, I can figure out what you, where you're going to go and everything else. Because Duke's like Duke learned from his father. And they footwork, footwork, footwork all the time. And I watch that, and I start understanding. I watch what a lot of people watch the actual strike. I watch Duke's feet. I watch what he did with his hands. And once I did that, striking is becomes became not, not as difficult. Yeah. You know, and it's like everyone is like, if you're feet in the wrong place, you shouldn't be doing certain you know certain things. I understand that, and we you know the hand fighting. We're a big believer in hand fighting. Anthony used it beautifully in his last fight in the UFC. It looked amazing. He, yeah, he. I mean, he kept hitting. He made if he wouldn't have he did one kick early in the first round that put him in a bad position. Yeah. If he wouldn't have done that, I think he could have stopped him in this uh, second round. Yeah. I mean, he almost stopped him in the third. third round, yeah. But he was like the timing and everything, and Anthony, you know, Anthony just is one move away from finishing anybody. But I mean, if you watch, he you know, lefty righty outside the hand fight, and you know, it's like he it was a beautiful job. I'm yeah, I'm really excited to see him go over to PFL. Um, hold on, before I go even further, do you need another one of those? No, I'm good. Thanks. All right, Randy, would you do me a favor? Uh, big shout out to my my little brother who's uh co-producing the show. Would you grab me a Boddington's and one of those glasses from uh up in the cabinet, one of the Boddington glasses? Um. Yeah, I'm really excited to see him in PFL. Now, they're doing a, a 155 tournament, mm-hmm. uh, basically introducing him to Now, I'm a little unfamiliar with PFL. I, I, I started glancing over it because of the fact that Anthony went in there. But how – it because they were explaining it as a season. So do they do yeah. this as kind of like the same way an NFL would do a season or – Obviously, it's- they will do a season. They're obviously much shorter. What they'll do is, I think they have a couple warm up fights, you know, the, and, on this, and then they're still in. Everyone's in the tournament's going to fight, and then uh, I think they will have a. They get points, but they also how they seed them. You know, does that make you know? They, I think they're going to because they have to seed everybody. Okay, so like for example, Anthony's probably the number one seed in the so tournament. He'll get a fight. Well, well, he'll get a fight if he wins. He'll be here, and they'll they'll mark they'll put him accordingly. Oh, so yeah. he's got to do like an ex, yeah. not yeah. like an, an exhibition, exhibition no, but, but like next fight, yeah, before the tournament. Yeah. So I think he has it's one, but then I mean, when he starts fighting, I mean, he's fighting like fast. It's just, I mean, it goes boom, 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 boom. I mean, it's not like it takes a course of a year to last. It's gonna, I mean, it's it's a shorter amount of time, you know, because it's like, I mean, and that's one of the reasons why they don't allow elbows in the PFL because an a cut it will ruin. The whole tournament, the mm-hmm. seating. You know, he, one guy gets cut, odds are he's not going to make it in the next fight. He just won't be able to get cleared. He won't heal up fast enough. Oh, I didn't know they didn't have elbows. Yeah, they don't allow elbows in any of their PFL fights. Okay. Which is just because it, it would just mess up. I mean, and also, too, that means if the guy got cut, somebody else, they're always going to have their uh, the standbys. I don't know what they call them, but they'll say, like, oh, I'm going to step He was going to step in. What if a guy didn't fight the whole tournament and all of a sudden he steps in in the semifinals and only has to fight once or twice? Yeah. It's not really fair. Yeah, I, I see that. I mean, the, what they do now is by having that, and if somebody does fall out, they have all the bracket of other guys. Alternates, yeah. yeah. That have already fought in the tournament, and they might get to come back in. 
if somebody else can't step in. The guy, the, the guy, they're never gonna go. Like, oh, you you win a million dollars on a buy. That is not gonna happen. Yeah, yeah, they're gonna you're gonna fight somebody. Yeah. <laughs> I'm excited to see him go over there. Um, is he doing commentary now too after the season's over? Then I or? think he's gonna do some of it. Yes, I believe so. I'm excited um, to hear yeah. that. I'm definitely. And, there's a couple and, of times he did the UFC and he yeah, did. Re- yeah. He was real crispy. Yeah. Best thing with Anthony is like when you fought when he first was on Fox. You see the guys wore it looked like they went to, you know, the big and tall shops and were shopping, or they got to that uh, uh, like a like a Macy's to get a suit. Anthony came in with you know we're all looking sharp and everything dressed, you know, a little flair that he has. And I think the producers and the Fox were like, hey. This kid is coming in here looking like this. You guys need to step your game up. You know what I'm saying? Because <laughs> Anthony, and all of a sudden, everything else, they all of a sudden they're like, before it was like a blue, it was like a blue jacket, white shirt, and blue tie. It's like you know, fighters. Most a lot of fighters aren't worrying about fashion. They're in sweats all the time. Yeah. And, you know, Anthony's got his, you know, he's got some good style, and he's he had a little flash to it. And all that look. I mean, I, I don't know for sure, but like I said, he was on there. Next thing you know, everyone else started dressing a lot nicer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think he goes to uh, I think he goes to Nas, Nas down yeah. the street. Big yeah. shout out to Nas Lane. He's an Arsenal fan, but I still have respect yeah. for him. But uh, no, he's got he's got some great suits over there. Um, I ran to Nas last night. And I talked to him for a little bit. He was down at, he was down in Tampa for the Super Bowl, and he was just wiling out, having a good time. I always like running into that cat, man. Yeah, I've been, I've known him from back when he worked at. Uh, Mayfair Mall. Oh yeah, I worked uh, with him Backrack. at Backrack. Yeah, yeah, Backrack. Yeah, I knew him back then. I haven't, I haven't bought anything from him yet. I'm not a suit guy. I'm more of a, of a sport coat. Yeah, but I want to go see him in a sport for a sport coat. He uh he got me dressed up for uh the the winter or the Christmas formal uh-huh. uh the one that they did at the, the gala the yeah the gala. Yeah. Um, I mean, he didn't have much to work with you, so you can only do so much. You know? <laughs> Listen, man, it ain't, it ain't, I'll tell you what, man. It is not easy to polish a turd, but that man did some work. <laughs> yeah, man, Nas is good people. Um, yeah, big shout. If you guys ever need a suit or anything like that, he is not a sponsor on this. Um, but NL Suits is a spot to go. And then he's got a little shop next door. I got my shoes over there. I got my belt. Got everything all in one place. Um, yeah, he's got a great, great spot over there. He was he was looking at a building in this neighborhood. I don't want to name where the building is, yeah. but I was like, "Oh, you can be in my block again." I was like, yeah. "Oh, I can just run across the street and get some clothes now." I like the fact that you offer you can do, do the lining. I mean, I'm not like a flashy guy, but I want a certain like a cut that fits well. But then you, I'd make my flash on the inside, the lining, yeah, maybe a little buttons or something like that. But you know, I've seen. I mean, friends of ours have. Uh, has some pretty flashy outfits. I'm like, he's very sharp, but I, I don't want you know, I'm not going to try to pull that off. Yeah. <laughs> That's not me. Yeah. I, yeah, I mean, like I said, I always have a good time uh, catching that. You know, I wanted to circle back to one other thing, and then we'll probably, because I think we've been talking about uh, fighting now for about an hour. Um, I want to talk about John Jones going to heavyweight. Um, yeah. Well, number one, Steep, he's getting the winner of Steep A, Francis Nugano. Nugano. Um, Dana White announced that I believe earlier this week, excuse me, that he was going to take the winner of uh, uh, Stipe and uh, Nuganu. What are your thoughts about him moving up to heavyweight? I, I mean, mean J- John Jones is, you know, he's a, uh, I mean, he's a freak athlete. I mean, he's, I mean, he's done a lot of stuff that a lot of people don't see. I mean, he wrestled like I don't know if it was a junior college or a division two or three, but I mean, his wrestling coach um, was also his. Fa- I, I forget his wrestling coach's name, but his family was very involved in judo. So it's like they also – there's a lot of the trips and throws that the people don't know that John knows because of his wrestling coach. And he you don't you don't see John do straight wrestling very often. He works with the wrestling coach, you know, for more stuff against the fence and everything else. But what he does is, I mean, he gets people off balance. And if – and that guy's a freak. I mean, lengthwise. I mean, he's gonna, still gonna he's gonna go up in weight class, and he's still gonna have the longest reach. You know, I think. I mean, he's he's just. I mean, his arms are so long, and he uses it. You know, he can use it well. The one, uh, my my opinion, the only thing he doesn't do, and he's never shown that crispy hand pop, punching power. You know, it's never. He's never really like, set people yeah, down. Yeah, set people down with his hands. And you're facing big dudes that get hit by other big dudes. Nagano's a freak. Mm. He left. He lifted uh, Overeem literally off of his feet with an uppercut. I mean, and Stipe is a huge man. 
Uh, there's a we've trained down at his gym when uh, UFC was there, and there's literally Stipe's in the middle, and there was two people on each side of him. And there was like, and it was literally myself and Duke when we were both, you know, not small guys, and he had his arms around us, like in one arm on both of our shoulders, like it was nothing. The guy's a large man. <laughs> <laughs> and the guy was scary big. I mean, it is it scary, but so it's like him moving up. You know, he's yeah he's he's taken weathered the storm against uh have you know two o fivers you mm-hmm. know when he's got hit he's got I mean you know so he, he he's never he's been hurt but not terrible and, but I mean the, the true heavyweights are they're killers yeah it's I mean that that punching power you know it's like and John's kicks are good but not great you know so I mean he he's an overall martial you know fighter he doesn't do any one thing great but he just when he does put it together. I mean, he's so long with his, you know, he does the elbows against certain people and all that, but in his understanding of how to fight, he doesn't get overworked up, you know, and so he still, he stays so calm in there that he can do things that people don't think about. Mm-hmm. But like I said, when you put in somebody like an Aganu or if he beats Stipe, it's a scary, scary dude. Yeah, know? I'm a, I'm curious to see, well, number one, I think the Stipe, uh, Nuganu rematch will be, will be interesting to see. Um, I want to see how Nuganu, if if he can if figure out the evolved. puzzle, if he's evolved, yeah, and if he can figure out that puzzle of how to get around Stipe. Because last yeah. time, Stipe, Stipe got caught by him pretty early, either in the mm-hmm. first or second round, and Nuganu put it on him, and then he just started wrestling yeah, him from yeah. there, and just and just took yeah. him down and well, wore him out. I mean, bottom line, if you put a guy on his back, it's hard for him to punch you hard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I mean yeah. that's the thing. You don't yeah. you don't want to get hit by that guy. The guy's got like a ma- he's got a hand like a goddamn soup yeah. can. Yeah. Um, and then you you see the force that he put on, not Arlovsky, um, the the uh, the, uh, the ream put yeah, snapped his head back. Yeah. Uh, Alistair Overeem, um, snapped his head back completely with that uppercut, and yeah. it's just it, yeah, it's it's scary. scary. Yeah, yeah, truly scary. And he, and he's I mean it's scary when he's that big and and he's fast too. Yeah. I mean you think oh Jones is gonna have the speed advantage. I think Jones the one thing he's gonna have is the timing. You know he's he's he gets that. But again, it's up to people to figure out. I mean, start leg kicking John Jones. How, how's that going to affect his mobility? You take one or two rounds of eating low kicks, all of a sudden you can't move quite as well. Can yeah. he do the same things? You know, it's it's tough. I mean, and he's shown he's been in some wars and he's weathered the storm. But at the same time, it's like like I said, t- uh, true heavyweight, uh, a guy that's naturally as big as Stipe. Like Nagano's obviously has built himself up to lifting and everything. But and I'm I know Stipe's done it too, but Stipe's a naturally very large man. Mm-hmm. I mean, I I'd rather the naturally big guy to me is always has an advantage of a guy that's built himself up to be that size. You yeah. know, it's a, a natural big guy, so it's like it's going to be tough. I'm not saying he can't do it, but it's tough. I'm excited to see it. Um, they said probably uh, whoever wins the the Stipe yeah. Nuganu fight, they'll probably try and set that one for July yeah. for for Jones and and the the winner of that. Even one. Israel going up to 205. That's that's Jan. A... Jan's a big, strong guy. Has I one mean, tough he, Polak. Not, yeah, he <laughs> is. I mean, and he hits hard. Yeah. So I mean, you know, like I said, well, he it, put it on Reyes. Yeah. And you, you know you. I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no, that's okay. But but going back to to John Jones for a second, uh, you saw, um, you saw Reyes push the pace with John Jones and go five rounds with him, and Jan shut him down by the second right. round. I mean, you look at Jan will throw the lead leg kick to the body, and he isn't technically doesn't look like that much, but he's a big dude that's a big leg hitting you in the arms it's it's gonna hurt you know it's like a tree trunk yeah (laughs) it hurts you know so it's like so it's one thing he doesn't when he throws he throws to hurt you he doesn't Mm -hmm. even if it's not the best technique in the world but he throws but his hands he's got he's deceptive you know i mean he's got some he's got some crazy power i mean and like the people that like koryak when he first beat him the first time he got him down, and he, you know, he beat him by taking him down and taking him off his feet. Like I said earlier, if you take a guy that can punch off his feet, he can't hit hit that hard. Second fight, you know, Corey didn't get that takedown, and he got caught, you know, throwing the low kick. Yeah, I was gonna say, I'm like he was throwing a leg kick, yeah, and, I think and he, he got, got hit caught over, with the, right. over the top. Yeah. yeah. So in Israel, doesn't have the wrestling that that Corey does. So if it's straight stand up, I mean. 
it's it's going to be tough. I'm I'm really interested. Number one, that card is stacked to the rafters. You got Peter Yan, uh, uh, Aljamain Sterling. Yeah, I mean, I love. I'm a huge fan of Peter Yan. His style of fighting is I love it. Let me pull this up really quick. I mean, he doesn't he doesn't go backwards. He's up in your fa- he steps into the fire and he and that's part of what he you know the Russians will do that a lot because they'll step into the fire because they trust the defense. Peter Yan will get up in the grill and throw and he goes he'll dare you to throw at him because that's when he knows he can hit you the hardest. You know he doesn't like run. You know it's and it's you have the only way you can do fight like that is you gotta have trust. Not only your defense and striking, but also you got a really good wrestling, you know. And then and trust your wrestling, your defense. People think wrestling is always about offense of taking somebody down. If you can use your wrestling to keep it standing, and then use your striking where it's better. So yeah. it's going to be an interesting fight. Aljamain technically has the chops in wrestling, mm-hmm. but PD on, I mean, it's a different style. Sambo, what they do in Russia is a, a sambo. It's like it's totally different than what most people think. It's wrestling. It's it's, it's sambo's basically MMA. You know, they kick punch. All of a sudden, they, they take downs off of it. Yeah, they bl- you know they've been doing that for years. Yeah, yeah. So it'll be interesting. You know, running through this card, uh, I'm taking a look at Amanda New. Well, actually, here, this is just crispy all the way through. Uh, I'm looking at the undercard. Here we go. Uh, Thiago Santos is fighting on the undercard. Uh, I do. I think. Uh, I think um, Dominic Cruz is on the undercard. He is. He's so shaking is the curtain. Benavides is on the yeah, undercard, and he's a number I mean, two yeah, ranked. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's so a, it's a that, stacked yeah. card through and through. The fact that you get those the two former champions or oh, Benavides is how many multiple time you know for, challenger. Yeah. I mean, he's been namesake way back in WC days that he's on the undercard. Yeah. Dude, that's he was huge. Yeah, we were yeah. we were talking about that last night. Um, and then you got Megan Anderson out of Factory X fighting Amanda Nunes, uh, for the women's featherweight Amanda's title. A beast. Uh, Amanda's a beast. Yeah. Megan's long. Uh, uh, it's who? I mean, it's again if Megan can and catch her coming in with stuff. But again, man, I mean, I I don't know her. I've seen her. Obviously, we've seen. I haven't seen her fight. But I've heard stories about it. She spars dudes that are her same size, and she goes puts it on them. Yeah, you know, like she's she goes she yeah no no issue. She's a uh, she's American top team, right? Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, yeah. ATT. Yeah, she goes down. But I mean, you look at her from the back. She's just like her back is like wide, you know, and she's a strong girl. Well, you, yeah, you know, you and, saw and what... she's evolved. I mean, she used to be pretty much just a boxer, you know, and now she's evolved. I mean, she well, look at what she she did do. Um, Holly Holmes caught it with a head kick. Yeah, you know, it's like you know, Holly Holmes is a very accomplished kickboxer, boxer, kickboxer, and she you know, it doesn't happen to her very much, you know. So Amanda, I mean, May, I, I, Megan's got the body style to beat her, but I just think I don't honestly, it's going to be a tough, tough fight. Yeah, I like the idea of catcher while coming in because I mean, obviously Amanda has to either push her up against the fence that's... to take the range away, or you know, she's got. You know, that's how she took out Cyborg. She pushed no. Cyborg up against the fence, took the range away, and then hit her with an overhand right yeah. and put her down. When she throws, when she throws, she also throws. She, she. I mean, some women throw for, to score. She throws a hurt. Yeah, you know, just hurt bombs. Yeah. <laughs> yep. yeah. When she lets her hands go, yeah. So yeah, she and she's evolved. She's another one that gets better and gets, stays in the gym, and she's she's getting better. Keep adding tools to her toolbox and. Keep going. Yeah, I'm excited for this card uh, through and through. Uh, also, uh, give a quick plug really quick. Again, I don't have sponsors, but I do host the fights. Uh, every pay-per-view over at Brothers uh, over on Water Street. If you want to come out, catch the fights. I was debating about trying to figure out how to do something as far as, like, if you actually watch this show to the five people that actually watch it. Like, <laughs> maybe I'll just, like, all five of my viewers that actually watch this come out and watch the fights yeah, with we'll me. We'll save you a bar stool to <laughs> sit there and watch it. <laughs> Oh man, uh, you know, going, you know, stepping aside from uh from from MMA now, um, it was great to see you last night. It was great to see um Vula and everyone else and all the guys from Waltiki, Jimmy, um, on Friday, and, yeah, on Friday. That's great that you guys came through. Yeah, we haven't been out like that in a year. Yeah, it's been crazy yeah. with the COVID, man. Um, crazy story though. Um, I don't even know if you caught it. We had the health department come in while everyone was there. 
And it was just one of those that it, it's been, we've been pretty diligent on keeping everyone seated and, and ha- making sure everyone has their mask on. I was really happy when, uh, the woman came through, uh, at Taylor's talk to, uh, talk to Jimmy and Jimmy was just like, yeah, you know, Jimmy Taylor, shout out to Jimmy Taylor over at Taylor's. Um, he was like, yeah, you know, Parker keeps everyone in line, got, got everyone wearing a mask and, and seated. I do know a couple of venues got hit kind of hard. Um, I am curious to see how this all goes, but, uh, but yeah, man, it was dealing with the health department is just one scary yeah. thing. Um, but the big thing that like, I've kind of tried to reinforce to, uh, to Jimmy is that, you know, we're, we're rule followers, you know, we, you know, if, if the health department comes through and goes, Hey, you need a sink over on that, on that bar over there. You know, we try and do that as, as best as possible. I, don't, I mean, I know it's a tough job. I know they don't have a lot of people, but it's just like they're targeting bars downtown Milwaukee way more than they are outside of this downtown. Mm-hmm. And I feel the bars downtown Milwaukee know that they're more in the limelight with, with the health department. So the majority of them are really strict on doing this stuff. I mean, I've, I've gone out not a lot, but I've, the few times I have been out, it's like, I know I usually go to bars when I know the people that own it or they work there and it's just they they're strict. You sit down, yeah, is it a pain in the butt, but I'm not going to get somebody in trouble because I don't want to do what follow, you know, the rules they have to. They don't want to follow. They don't want to have to do it, but they, you know, but they do to stay open. I think uh, there's a bar the bars outside of the city, the downtown, they're wide open. Yeah. They there's like no 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 f's given man they're just out there and it's like walk in no no mask you don't have to wear a mask walk in i when we walked in it was like literally one bar i'm not gonna say where but we literally walked in it but and we didn't say because there was no mask. but we just it was just too damn busy mm-hmm. nobody was you know not one person bartenders or anything had a mask on but nobody cared oh that's fine yeah we, we got the record uh, Randon was just giving me an update on, on what was going on. Uh, it might be a, I've been having a little bit of an internet problem, so it might be dropping out a little bit. Yeah. Um, there are a few places. I, I know the venue you're talking about. Um, the health department checked them out and I know they were, they were closed. Um, but you don't, I don't want to see any of that stuff happen, but I think, how do I put this? The customers that do complain, they forget that this is somebody's livelihood. Yeah. Um, for example, bartenders, waitresses, barbacks, owners, managers. Mm. When when you don't want to wear a mask, you don't want to follow the rules. You're putting all these people's livelihood in jeopardy. I mean, the fact that they can't, you know, only the twenty five percent rule, is, and then you got to only be sitting down. I mean, it's not fun. You got a group of friends. Hey, you run into them. You can't go over there and hang out with them, and then come back to your table. You just can't do it anymore right yeah. now. And it's like, and, and it, it's it's not as fun to go out. But I mean, I'd like to support more, but at the same time, I the few times I do go out, I go to usually when I know no people. And it's just because, you know, the comfort level, it's like I can visit people I know that are working or and I support, you know, support them. But the people there's literally people like, oh, I shouldn't have to do this. Nobody wants you to have to do it. But it is that's the, it's, that's the way it is right now. Yeah. If you don't want to do it, sit home, have your friends over. That's it. It's it's does it suck? Yeah. Everyone thinks it sucks. Yeah, it Trust, does. Yeah. Even even the owner, owners of the bar, they, you know, they think it sucks. They're they're you know, they got to be hurting. Yeah, and it's it's a struggle. It's a struggle for everyone to get through, um, and there really hasn't been anything on a state or city level that's helping these venues. Where I kind of feel, and this is my personal perspective, I kind of feel that there's a harder spotlight, on, like you said, on the people downtown, and and it's not as hard of a spotlight as as people out in the burbs, um, and everyone downtown has that that bigger nut that they have to make yeah. every week with that higher rent. And there's nothing that's coming around to help them. Yeah. And, you know, I don't want to see any of these venues close um, because of the fact that, you know, masks or fines or people have to be seated. Um, I just hope that we can get through this quickly and easily and they roll out this vaccine. No, no it's... We can get it somewhat back to normal somewhat soon. Yeah, no, it's it's tough. It's a tough, <clears throat> it's a very tough thing to do. It's like, like I said, it's you want to support, but at the same time, it's like, you know, you have to pick and choose a when to support. And like I said, I know a few people that own bars, and it's it's tough, you know. I want to want to go, but 
at the same time, it's like I go like if I go, I usually go early. Yeah. And I go Friday night was probably one of the first time in the year I've stayed out past midnight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you were talking about yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. And other than that, it's just like being out is I go early. I'd, I'd rather go out early now, have some drinks so it's quiet, not as many people, mm-hmm. and or grab something to eat and then go home and be home early. You know, that's that's I start early and I leave earlier and it's I don't have to deal with crowds. You know, last night was was really good. Um, Like I said, shout out to Brett and James over at Brothers. They hooked us up with the back party room and then we had the fighters and and, a big also shout out to DJ Surge came through last night, hung out with me and and finally got to watch some fights with me. Um, But we sat in that back room. It was just all of us. And, you know, we had two huge tables. It's a big room and it can be open, so on and so forth. And we just sat there, had the audio for the fights, watching the fights the whole time, ordering food, ordering drinks. and, And it was great. Um, I did step out for a little bit. I stopped over at Taylor's, uh, saw Colin, uh, saw uh, Zach Sharp, who was on the show two weeks ago, ran to him and uh, hung out for a little bit. But it's for me, from from my perspective, it's hard to go out and not see DJs like my my thing is I want to hear music. I want to hear culture. I want to as much as I want to socialize with people. I just want to hear music. I want to hear a good mix. I want to hear, you know. You know, what are other people doing? What are other people playing? And I kind of just want to, you know, I don't necessarily take my cues, but I want, oh, that's interesting. I like where they're going with this. I like what they're doing here. I like how they're reading the room. I, you know, that's, that's a, uh, something I didn't see. I don't like cl- uh, crowd watching. Without DJs around, it's kind of hard to go out for me. You know well, what I mean? Well, people are, is, yeah, without, well, the DJs get people up moving. You know, a good DJ will get people up on the dance floor. They get moving around. You get a little more. I mean, even I don't get up on the dance floor, but I get more upbeat, listening to some music and everything, having fun. And I, and like I said, I'll sit back when you used to spin, and I'd be like going. I just set up by you, not because I want to be cool to be by the DJ. <laughs> I set up by you because I didn't want to be around everybody. I just wanted to watch everybody. Yeah. <laughs> and, and but I'm actually surprised bars have not raised the prices a little bit I, on their drink, just because it's like, hey, we only get this many people. You know, we got everyone's got to be sitting down. Even if they get full capacity of the sitting down, mm-hmm. they still can't be up. And what about all the people that just stand? You know, yeah. it's like you, they they got to be. I mean, you you don't you can't realize how much they're losing because of all this. And I'm I'm I'd be and I'd be okay with it if they raised say it was fifty cents a drink on across the board. I'd be okay with it just to be like I understand that's how it is. It's just the way it is, you know. And because I'd rather not pay fifty cents more a drink them them close having a bar that i like going to close down yeah you know because i don't like going to that many places <laughs> yeah I, I hear you on that there aren't there ain't a whole hell of a lot yeah. of places i go into either there's there's those comfort spots yeah. that where you know people you walk in you know who's going to be behind the bar you yeah. know you know the owner's going to be there so on and so forth yeah. you know you guys are going to rip a couple of shots and stuff like that it's it's been difficult man um you know between my girlfriend and i you know we talk about this on a regular basis when we get a night off it's 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 easy to stay home because of the fact that you know we we want to go out we we've gone out a couple of times and um but it's it's you know yeah. we don't want to deal with the fucking hassle yeah. and, it, and it's it's tough and it sucks because i want to see my friends at the same time but it's it's hard to to feel comfortable to your point though i do like the idea i'd have no problem with paying an extra dollar to a drink or what i thought about was um covers yeah i yep i was just gonna say thing the same thing put in a cover back put especially a, if you want a dj yeah if you're gonna listen to the dj and you can't pay the cover charge i mean people in milwaukee are spoiled yeah i mean they're like what do you mean a cover charge it's like oh you say you're getting everything dirt cheap and drinks free you know and drinks are cheaper you know you you get people come from chicago they're like really that's all it is here give yeah. me two more you know? <laughs> <laughs> you, know? you know that you know to your point too you know, when I was out in Vegas, uh, we were talking about this off air two weeks ago. Um, I was going to go see Dylan Francis at Excess uh, at the Win, and it was a seventy-five dollar cover. And I was like, I'm going to see Dylan fucking Francis. You know, <laughs> it, you know, there's there's some amazing DJs out there, and I was like, dude, I think that's to see him in a venue like that um, for seventy-five dollars. I think they're undercharging, but I'm like, fuck it. Take my money. Well, Take also, my money. Well, say think, less. What would it be if you were there at an outdoor stadium? You had to buy like a concert ticket. It'd it's probably be double or triple yeah. that. So it's like you go into a club, you know, smaller venue. It's like, but still paying. You're still getting a deal. Yeah. You know, yeah. like. Oh, go ahead. I mean, my girl and I, we've been uh, together 
almost going on you know, a little over 17 years and we met while you know, I was in the service industry where you know she was and we both worked at the same bar and it's like it, that habit of going out being out you know it's like and we knew so many people from working together and throughout the years I mean that we go out we we always know somebody that works is working somewhere yeah. and it, it is it's it's tough to just lose track of you know people it's like oh you haven't seen them forever but it, it's like hey it's, it's in a way we, we're we've actually i when i when i stopped working in the service industry one of the hardest things for me to do is not to go out on the weekends i was so used to just being in being in the you know out to, even though i was working that when i first stopped working i was out all the time on the weekends just not doing anything crazy just going out being around people and then now we're at the point, both of us are at the point where like, wow, well, we're cool sitting home. We only have a couple of friends over and all summer long. I think every every weekend we said, we have like two or three people come over, sit in the backyard, light a fire, drink, put some music on and just, you know, have a good time. And you, people, I think people are realizing, you don't, they're being more selective of what's fun or what's, you know, like you get a group of people that you enjoy being with and you just spend it in a lot you know quieter settings it's just it's still not still a good time you know but you don't have to be around all the other people yeah it's to your point you are correct it's it's hard to be around other people sometimes but i've been around for those for those summer get-togethers and they were a lot of fun especially new year's um your new year's party was a blast yeah. man all those games and stuff like uh, that yeah, um, a shout out to vula mios because she that was i i just helped set it up because that was all her idea yeah, yeah we had a blast yeah i had a blast too man yeah it was a fun time. Never, I mean, I was like, "Oh, you playing games?" But hey, we were, we were, it was so much fun. Everyone was laughing. Well, we were so competitive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> guys versus girls. Just so way, just so you know, all guys kick the girls' butts. You know, yeah, yeah. a minute to win at games. Well, yeah, yeah. I had a blast, man. Um, you know what? I think we've been going for about two hours here, uh, and the time just flew by. Uh, Scott Cushman, thank you so much for coming on. This has been a blast just picking your brain about everything and, and, and listening to you talk uh, about fighting in general and, and your philosophy and being able to pick your brain. Uh, you're an amazing friend, an amazing coach, and, and thank, thank you for coming on well, here, thanks man. Thanks for having I, me. I much appreciate, appreciate it. It was fun. Didn't um, know what to expect, but I had fun. <laughs> uh, I definitely want to have you back on again soon. Uh, maybe a couple of months down the line, we'll do this again after a UFC fight or a, a big pay per view again. Hopefully, I'll get back uh, you know, in March. I'll be going to some fights, so I'll yeah. be able to go. Yeah. How's the ankle? How's the ankle going so uh, far? Healed so good? up. Yeah. So you know, you're getting old when they're getting rid of, you know, putting in new body parts. <laughs> you know, so I'm healing up. It's all going good. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. Still wishing you a speedy recovery. Can't wait to see you back on the mats and coaching and so on and so forth. But once again, uh, Scott Cushman, thank you very much. Um, that's it um, for us here at uh, Zero Cools World. Um, do me a favor. If you're still listening, you're still tuned in, hit that like or subscribe button, uh, get the notifications for when we do these. We have more guests coming on uh, in the upcoming future. Uh, next week is DJ YB and DJ Steve Marks, uh, famously of the No Request DJs, uh, No Request Sounds. We're going to have them here, have them both on. We're going to be nerding out, talking music, and uh, having some good times. So once again, everyone, thank you for tuning in. We'll see you next week around the same time next week, Sunday. Be well, everyone. Mahalo.